What's he saying? My messiahship is confirmed by the miracles that I do and by the reality that I'm proclaiming the good news of reconciliation with God to the poorest of the poor, because that's exactly what the prophets told us the messiah was going to do. Welcome to A Jew and a Gentile Discuss. I'm your co-host, Carly Berna. And I'm Ezra Benjamin. We're a Jew and a Gentile who both believe in Jesus and believe that there's value in looking at history as well as today's world in the headlines through both a Jewish and a Christian lens. Today we're going to talk ironically about Jesus, but what does a Christian think about Jesus the Messiah and what does a Jewish person think about Jesus the Messiah? What are the differences? What are the similarities? We'll explain all of that, but before we get to that, As we do on every podcast, we want to remind you that you can partner with us as we support Jewish communities around the world who've actually never heard about Jesus the Messiah. We bring physical care as well as spiritual care, and we actually have coffee from one of the countries that we go and help, which is Ethiopia. We call it the Lost Tribes Coffee. You can go on our website and get some of that. Uh, And if you stay tuned to the end of this podcast, you can enter for a chance to win that coffee for free. So let's discuss. So Ezra, Jesus, obviously this is like the center of the Christian, quote unquote, religion. Right. And for me, when I came to accept Jesus, it was all about my personal sin, needing a savior from that sin, Jesus died for my sins Mm -hmm. and took all of those sins away. And so why wouldn't I accept Jesus who would be a personal redeemer for me? Okay. So I think before before we talk about the Jewish perspective, because I could reply in kind, right, and say, well, for Jewish people, Jesus is, but let's not go there. Like, let's first talk about the idea of a Messiah. So my hunch, and speak to this from your own experience, is the idea of a Messiah is central to Jewish thinking. Maybe not secular Jewish thinking, where you're not sure if the Bible is just a nice storybook about Jewish people, or if it's actually the inspired word of a living God, or does God even exist, and if he does, has he actually chosen us, and that's why we're the chosen people. Uh, but but anyway, if you're if you're of the more religious or more, let's say, Torah or Bible observant persuasion of the worldwide Jewish community, the idea of a Messiah is central, and it has some very specific concepts or foundational ideas that we'll talk about in just a minute. But my hunch is for somebody outside the Jewish community, okay, so they don't come from a Catholic background or, or you know, more, a more traditional Christian uh, denomination or Christian upbringing, Messiah isn't even the question, right? Like, what do you think about the Messiah? Well, what, what does that mean? Like, I think I'm a man or a woman, and I'm living my life, and I'm doing just fine. You're asking me a theological term. You mean like Handel's Messiah, that song we sing at Christmas? Right? It's not really, it's not a thing, the idea of the Messiah. So your on-ramp, as an example, from a Gentile background was personal awareness of sin or being separated from God, right? And something being wrong about that and a need for a savior and then encountering the person of Jesus who is understood to be the Messiah, right? But it was, okay, personal conviction, Jesus the man who I think I'm going to receive as my Lord and Savior and he saved me because he's the Messiah. Is that right. like yep. a fair trajectory yeah. that's that's the progression definitely something you just said though I'd n- I've never thought about before which is the idea of the Messiah is central to Judaism right which is interesting because I it's true but I've never thought of it like that because Jesus being that Messiah is not central to Judaism but the need for a Messiah is central to Judaism totally and that's a bit of what we're trying to unpack in this particular episode of a Jew and a Gentile discuss right I think you know, you and I work in a Jewish ministry, and we both believe, as we said, that Jesus is the Messiah. We say it every episode. And so a big part of our work and efforts around the world are to meet practical needs of Jewish communities, to earn the right to share what we believe is that most important message, that in fact Israel does have a, have a Messiah, and his name is Jesus. But we also understand that a significant portion of the Jewish community worldwide rejects the idea of Jesus as the Messiah. 
But we have to be careful not to conclude then that the majority of Jewish people around the world reject the idea of a Messiah at all, right? right? The question is, do I believe that there is such a thing as a Messiah? And if I do, then what do I believe that that person has to accomplish, right, in order for me to believe that they are who they say they are, they are the Messiah, in Hebrew, it's Mashiach, which literally means anointed one or the chosen one, okay? Uh, and then thirdly, once I understand what the Messiah has to do, who they have to be, how they have to live, what they have to accomplish, do I believe that Jesus, in fact, fits that bill, right? But for a Jewish person, that's the third question, or at least it should be. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, for Jewish ears and in a Jewish worldview, when you hear Jesus, you're not thinking, Messiah of Israel at all. You're thinking God of the Christians, and the conversation ends right there. And so part of what we're doing on a Jew and a Gentile Discuss is encouraging our Jewish audience and equipping our Christian audience to try to change the conversation and say, don't let it stop at Jesus, the God of the Christians. Push on that to the point of, do we believe there is such a thing as a Messiah? What did he have to do? How do we know it's him? And then did Jesus do those things? Did Jesus accomplish those things? Do you think a Jewish person actually goes through those three steps and goes and eventually gets to the end and says, no, Jesus does not fit this bill? Or most of them are raised in a home that they just know Jesus is the God of the Christians. It's not like they've gone through and said, and he doesn't fit all of the messianic claims. I think it's the latter. And that's part of what we're trying to push on here. You know, you and I both serve at Jewish Voice Ministries and then also, you know, devote a lot of our time to this podcast. I want to I wanna push on that because the answer is no. We don't go through that filter. We should, if there was even a possibility in the average Jewish mind that Jesus might actually be the Messiah of Israel. But because we've concluded Jesus isn't for the Jews because Jesus represents a group of people who have misunderstood or even persecuted us throughout history and is the God of the Christians and has nothing to do with us, then we don't ever go through that process at all. And so we want to kind of open up that process in the minutes we have today. Yeah. And w what is Jewish thinking on the idea of the Messiah? How does that differ from Christian thinking that leads someone to receive Jesus? And where's the common ground? Yeah, and I would say maybe naively, it wasn't until I really started working in Jewish ministry that I really even understood that there were these messianic prophecies and Jesus fulfilled them. Right. So what what are these things that a Jewish person is waiting for when they're looking at who is the Messiah? Yeah, super good question. And you know, again, for somebody to reject Jesus as the Messiah doesn't mean I'm going to use a dangerous term, that they aren't wired to be messianic. Now, what do you mean by that, Ezra? You just said a mouthful. I mean that they aren't looking for a Messiah to come and redeem Israel, especially the ultra-religious or ultra-Orthodox. I'll use another term, like some of the most conservative of ultra-Orthodox groups on earth are called the Lubavitch. And it's this super Torah-observant, God of Israel committed, religious, zealous for the Jewish faith, inwardly focused Jewish community uh, that, that may be one of the most inwardly focused and religiously zealous as has ever existed in Judaism historically, and certainly in the 20th century. So as an example, if you go to Israel, um, and it's hard because it's, it's in Hebrew, but if you read a little bit of Hebrew, you're driving down the highway in Israel, and there's, Carly, there's literally billboards that somebody is paying to permanently rent out in downtown Tel Aviv, and these giant yellow banners on the sides of the highway with a crown in blue. And below it, it says in Hebrew, Mashiach, Messiah. And then these other billboards, huge billboards, like next to the Acura and BMW ads as you're driving through downtown Tel Aviv, are these billboards that say, we want King Messiah now. And huh. you're going, what on earth? I thought the Jewish people rejected Jesus. Yeah. Remember, when we talk about a Messiah, we're not talking about Jesus in terms of the general conversation in the world by Jewish community. And in fact, the group that's paying for these banners believes that a man named Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, who died in 1994 in New York City at Sinai Hospital, is the Messiah. Okay, so we're getting to what's the requirements of a Messiah. But my point is that there's this I would say tens of thousands, maybe more, out of the millions of Jewish people on earth who 
really believe that this man who never went to the land of Israel in his life, okay, who lived in, in Queens, uh, is the Messiah. And they're so committed to his Messiahship, even though we're recording this in 2022, the guy's been in a grave in New York City for 18 years and counting, but they believe he will rise from the dead and be the Messiah. Now, why do they believe that Menachem Schneerson is the Messiah? There's a couple things that Jewish people are looking for when, when they, when we, think about the Messiah, okay? We see these in the scriptures and the rabbis over centuries have developed a lot of these traditions. So one of them is the idea that this person would be a national reformer in Israel, that they would call the Jewish people to repentance and to return to the Lord, to Torah observance, to fulfill the 613 commandments that Moses lays out in the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, which is also the first five books of the Christian scriptures, the Christian Bible. Um, so a national reformer and leader in repentance, okay? Menachem Schneerson did draw many people back to really an ultra-zealous, literal observance uh, as, as uh, interpreted by the rabbis of what it meant to be a religious and observant Jew, an obedient Jewish man or woman, okay? So another thing that people are looking for is good works. So a couple U.S. presidents actually awarded Menachem Schneerson this great honor in education because he opened so many educational institutions to try to provide uh, access to education for children, not just Jewish children, any children. So that's an example of somebody doing good works, okay, like meeting practical needs as a follower of the God of Israel that would uh, maybe qualify them for messiahship, if you will, all right? So we have leader in repentance, uh, doer of good works, and leader in good works. Another thing is uh, the idea of a prince of peace. We see this language in the scriptures. In Hebrew, it's sar shalom, prince of peace. So one who would do things that lead to peace, not just among the Jewish people, but actually peace on earth world peace. Menachem Schneerson was big into peace and reconciliation, so that is another reason, according to this ultra-Orthodox group, that he would be qualified as the Messiah. Um, and then the fourth thing is this idea of a national redeemer. So where do we get that? It's from this idea in the scriptures where God says to King David, one in your line will not cease to sit on the throne before me forever. So there's this idea that a literal descendant of David, who was part of the tribe of Judah, okay, would uh, reign as the king of kings forever. And if a Jewish king is the king of kings, then the kingdom would be restored to Israel. And actually, Carly, I'm thinking of the language in Acts right before Jesus ascends, right? So now he's, he's died, he's walked out of the tomb, and his disciples are thinking, this is it. This is the Messiah. He's confirmed it by his resurrection from the dead. And they say to him in Acts 1, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, what the heck are they talking about? We, you know, from a Christian perspective, well, he died for our sins. We're good, right? Like what else is there to do? No, the Jewish mind, even to this day, understands that the Messiah would be a king of kings, a restorer of a kingdom to Israel, though Israel's been oppressed and scattered among the nations for centuries, even millennia. And Jesus goes, he doesn't say to them, no, what the heck are you talking about? There's no kingdom, right? He says, it's not for you to know the day or the hour that the Father is set in his own authority. But in the meantime, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit and you will uh, be instrumental in doing the will of the Father on earth as it is in heaven, just like I've taught you to pray. So anyway, more on Jesus in a minute, but that's, that's an example that we see in the New Testament of this idea of kingship, which might be a little bit unfamiliar to uh, Gentile ears or to Christian ears. So I guess I want to throw the question back to you. Like we said, all these qualifiers for the Messiah, for you, from, from a Christian perspective, like what's necessary for, me, for you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Like are there prerequisites or what? <laughs> yeah, when when you were saying all of that, I was thinking it's almost the opposite of a Christian perspective, which when I think about messianic claims, I think about Isaiah 53. Okay. Um, you know, pierced for our transgressions, on and on, the suffering servant, like that wasn't one of the things that you named. Interesting. So is, is a Jewish person really looking for those things? And then is like the suffering servant personal redeemer thing almost like second secondary? to the national piece of things that you explained? 
Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it's it's not either or. I think we see throughout the scriptures that one has everything to do for the other, with the other. Mm-hmm. And even Jesus said, right, like, I haven't come to abolish the law, because Jesus, a, a big part of Jesus' ministry was, I would say, leading people to repentance. Remember that first qualifier for Messiahship is being a leader in national redemption and repentance. But the way that Jesus was doing that was to challenge religious leaders in society and not say, what are you doing following the Torah? That's, I'm, that's done. I'm, you know, I'm the new way. What he was saying was, it's not about how you look to other people on the outside. It's about the condition of your heart. And so Jesus was drawn to people who genuinely understood in light of what the Torah says, I am a sinner, woe unto me, I need help. And he was repelled by and then openly challenged people who needed just as much help and in the privacy of their own hearts were just as much falling short of the glory of God and his laws and expectations and yet outwardly presented an image like everything was okay and even led other people in putting on an image rather than dealing with heart issues. So that was Jesus calling people to repentance, but his message was it's about you and the Father being reconciled because he's looking at the heart, not at the outward appearance, mm-hmm. right? He, not, he doesn't want whitewashed graves, as Jesus said, uh, and cups that are all clean on the outside but on the inside are dirty. He wants cleanliness and purity on the inside. And so for those who had ears to hear that, they understood, ah, this is one who's leading us back to God. Uh, but again, it requires that idea of a recognition of sin and an awareness of a need for forgiveness and redemption. And I would say, by and large, in the Jewish psyche, other than these kind of days of awe on the Jewish calendar between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur every year, when we're really kind of introspective and saying, like, you know, God is the King of Kings. Is my name written in his book of life? How do I know? It's not something that's thought about. And even Isaiah 53, uh, I'm thinking of this campaign that another organization did where they actually went around Israel and opened the the Old Testament in Hebrew to Isaiah 53 and had the average person on the street, religious, non religious, man, woman, old, young, read it out loud and say, Who, what do you see? And in so many cases, Carly, the person said, I see. You know, it's funny, they, they would say, I see Yeshu, which is a derogatory way of saying Yeshua in Hebrew. It, it literally is kind of a curse term, but they're referring to Jesus, to Yeshua. So if that's the case, and people so clearly saw Yeshua, saw Jesus in Isaiah 53, why isn't that being discussed more widely in the Jewish community? And the simple answer is because Isaiah 53 is just not discussed. It's so problematic to have to read a passage about one who was pierced for our transgressions and bruised, you know, who carried our iniquities and wasn't pleasant to look at, Isaiah said, and so we hid our faces from him. Mm -hmm. And this one who would make atonement for sins. It's not the typical way of thinking about messiahship in a Jewish mindset and worldview. Yeah, it was. In, it's interesting what you said just a few minutes ago up when you said it's not part of the Jewish psyche to think about personal sin. Because when you said that, I was thinking, well, what about Yom Kippur? Like, that's the time. Right. But then I was thinking, well, as a Christian, what about Easter? There's lots of Christians who right. go about their whole life in one day, from Good Friday to Easter, yeah. even shorter than Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. They think about that, and then they move on. And then we move so on. So it's right. very similar in that way for someone who's not really focused on that as part of their life, that it's just, you know, a cultural thing that you do, and then you move on. They're not wondering their whole life, where is the Messiah, and is Mm -hmm. Jesus the Messiah? Totally, yeah, the season of Lent on the Christian calendar. And we're not trying to, like, you know, poke holes in in the Jewish religious system or the Christian religious system here, but I think the challenge is any religious system, if I'm depending on a system for me to feel like I'm good in the eyes of a holy God, then there's going to be a time for me to think about sin and I'm going to limit that to the degree that I'm comfortable and confident that something's actually happened about it. Yeah. And I think that's the challenge in the Jewish world, maybe in the Gentile world too, right? If in my heart of hearts I'm actually not sure that God has made a way for me to be forgiven of my sins, I can't endure thinking about that too long or too deeply before I just have to move on because mm-hmm. it's too painful a thought. Yeah. So you named these things. So besides, you know, Suffering servant, which Isaiah 53 covers that, and we agreed, you know, Jesus met that guideline check. These other ones you named, well, I guess from your perspective as a Messianic Jewish 
believer right. has, did Jesus meet those guidelines? Yeah, well, I think in John, you know, John 10 is a really interesting passage because at least a part of it happens during Hanukkah. And, you know, we're releasing this episode a month or so before the Hanukkah season, Carly, and it says it was winter and it was the Feast of Dedication and Jesus is in the temple. So mm-hmm. by those three qualifiers, John's making it very clear to us, this is Hanukkah. Even though it's not a biblical holiday, we know that Jesus was observing it and he's walking in the temple and it says in in um, in verse 24 of John chapter 10, it says, then the Jews or the Jewish leaders surrounded him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? It says in English, if you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Well, Christ, Christos, is the same word for Messiah or Mashiach in Hebrew. Okay, Christ has become Christian uh, in modern thinking, but Christ is just is Messiah. Okay, so they surround Jesus and say, if you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Right? It didn't come out of left field. Jesus wasn't there inventing another religion. He was making it clear, I'm the Messiah that Israel's waited for. And the people are saying to him, show us clearly. Why don't you just tell us? Remember that good works, right? A prerequisite of the Messiah is that they have to do specific good works. And so look at Jesus' answer to them in verse 25. It says, Jesus, Yeshua answered them, I told you, in essence, I told you already the question you're asking me or the answer you're asking me, and you do not believe. Listen, the works that I do in my Father's name, they are what bear witness of me, but you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. And so what works is he talking about? I'm thinking of John the Baptist before he gets beheaded has this moment of doubt. We see it also in John, and he he sends messengers to Jesus to say, are you the one we've waited for, or are we still waiting for someone else? He's asking the same question. Jesus, are you the Messiah? And how does Jesus answer him? Yes, you dummy, you know, oh, you of little faith. How could you doubt after we've been together so long? No, he says, the gospel is preached to the poor, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf are healed. And it goes on, right? And it says, and blessed are those who are not offended because of me. Mm Mm-hmm. What's he saying? He's saying to John, just like he's saying to the Jewish leaders, my messiahship is confirmed by the miracles that I do and by the reality that I'm proclaiming the good news of reconciliation with God to the poorest of the poor. Because that's exactly what the prophets told us the messiah was going to do. And if you're not offended that the way the messiah is demonstrating his messiahship is different than you thought it would come to you, you're blessed. Mm -hmm. And that could be true to this day. It's interesting to me, actually, in an episode we recorded recently, we were talking about the culture of Judaism at the time that Jesus came and how we often make this mistake of we take our current situation and we look back through that filter. And what we're talking about now is how the current Jewish culture looks at Jesus and Mm -hmm. determines whether he's the Messiah or not. But we're talking about Jewish people back in the days of what we're reading in the New Testament who are determining, they know the scriptures, Totally. Like people now know the scriptures, right. and they're determining if, if that Jesus is the Messiah. Right. And the reason people were offended, right? Jesus is doing miraculous things. Like Lazarus walks out of a tomb after he's been dead over three days. Only in Jewish tradition, in Jewish thinking, only the Messiah could do that. Okay? So if we need a single event that was witnessed by many that confirms the messiahship of Jesus, other than his own walking out of a grave after his death on a cross, it's the, the walking out of Lazarus out of a tomb. Mm-hmm. Okay? Like we have all these songs about it, and you know, I'm taking my grave clothes off, and that's awesome by application. But literally, this was the harbinger of Jesus showing the world, I'm the Messiah. Right. Because no one walks out of a grave after three days mm-hmm. except that Jesus called him out. So Jesus is saying, I have resurrection power, I'm the Messiah, and yet so many don't believe. And then we come back to those two last qualifiers for Messiahship in Jewish thinking that cause so many people to stumble. The idea of being a national redeemer and the idea of being a prince of peace. And if you ask a Jewish person today who's even willing to engage with you, okay, and many religious Jewish people are, just say, just, you know, I'm speaking to our Christian audience for a minute, just say, Rabbi, humor me. Tell me why you think Jesus isn't the Messiah. And if he says, he's the God of the Christians, say, no, 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 like, just talk about the person, Jesus, the rabbi, Jesus, the Jewish man. Tell me why he can't be the Messiah. Probably, Carly, you're going to hear he hasn't redeemed Israel. There's no kingdom of Israel on earth. There's a political state, but it's not a theocracy. 
okay? It's not led as a kingdom under a king. And where's the peace on earth? Because we know the Messiah has to be the Prince of Peace, Mm -hmm. and there's no peace on earth. This is the enduring argument in Judaism, and this is where we, we have to come back to what Paul tells us is so central to the message of the gospel. He says, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, right? According to the way the prophets said it would have to happen, Isaiah 53. And he was buried. He had to be buried. It's in the scriptures. It's in the Psalms. It's in the prophets. And he rose from the dead according to the scriptures because it says your Holy One, your Messiah, won't see decay in the Old Testament scriptures. And then this last super important phrase, and his resurrection was witnessed by many. Okay? So the witness of hundreds of people of a resurrected Jesus who had been dead confirms his messiahship. Now, if that's true, the disciples were saying, why not not bring your kingdom to pass now? Will Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And what they couldn't yet see is the Lord was up to something far greater than just the salvation and redemption of Israel and the Jewish people. He was after the salvation of the world. That's ultimately why he died. Not to the exclusion of Israel, but first for Israel, like Romans 1.16 says, first for the Jew and also for the Gentile, also for non-Jewish people. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so these Jewish believers, before Jesus ascends to be with the Father, when they're super confused about how this guy who's clearly the Messiah is not bringing peace to earth and declaring that the kingdom has come back to Israel, Jesus says, ah, some last instructions. Now you go proclaim the good news of the Messiah to all people's tribes and tongues, beginning in Jerusalem. Mm. Because the gospel has to go to all the world before I come back to rule and reign. So that, in a nutshell, is perhaps the biggest misunderstanding and stumbling block today in a Jewish mindset about the Messiah. It's confusing and even a source of offense to a Jewish person that God would bring salvation, bring reconciliation to him through the Jewish Messiah to Gentiles who throughout history have had nothing to do with him. And likewise, I would say, Carly, it's an, maybe a source of misunderstanding, if not an offense, to a Christian person who totally loves Jesus as their own personal Savior and Redeemer, that Jesus isn't coming back until he has a national recognition among Jewish people that he is the Messiah mm-hmm. so that they too can be saved. Right? Both groups, if we don't hold both intention, personal Savior and national redeemer of Israel, if we don't understand both of those things, we have a risk of being offended. Yeah, it's like from the Jewish perspective, it all needs to happen to believe in Jesus. As you were talking, I was yeah. thinking, what do I believe as a Christian? I believe we're in the middle of that story. Yeah. That that will happen. Jesus right. will do that, but mm-hmm. we're right in the middle of it. And that's what we're trying to do every day of our lives sure. and what anyone who believes in Jesus is trying to do as well. Right. We're just right in the middle of it instead of looking back at it and saying, okay, I'm ready now to say that Jesus is the Messiah. Totally, totally. And understanding the full picture, I think, as we kind of you know land this plane for this episode, understanding the full picture of Jesus as a Prince of Peace and a King of Kings. Or let me say it differently. Understanding the full picture of the Messiah as a prince of peace, a king of kings, a redeemer and a restorer of Israel to the Lord and a restorer of a kingdom to Israel, and a personal redeemer of anyone who would call upon him and ask him to forgive them of their sins. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's the whole picture. And understanding that whole picture, according to the Hebrew scriptures, like New Testament aside, according to the Jewish scriptures, everything I just said is a picture of the Messiah that the prophets understood, that Moses foresaw, that the psalmists wrote about and sang about. Mm -hmm. That, Carly, I think will help Jews and Gentiles have a more fully orbed discussion, first about who the Messiah is anyway, and then secondly, and just as importantly, maybe even more importantly, could he be Jesus? And if I haven't thought that he could, maybe I should look again. Mm -hmm. Not at the God of the Christians I understand him to be, but at his person, at his works, at his words, and at his resurrection from the dead witnessed by hundreds and written about in historical literature. When I first became a Christian, I read a lot of C.S. Lewis, and Uh one of my favorite quotes that he says is, Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord. Totally. So 
you have to really determine what which of those he is because whatever choice is going to be life changing. Right. W- whichever of those you feel like he you know belongs to. Absolutely. So I hope to those listening, especially if you're a Jewish person, that this causes more questions that you write to us. Uh, ask us those questions. We're happy to dialogue about that and to a Gentile that this was informative, um, that perhaps you've looked at Jesus from your personal redemption light, but not always thought about the other messianic claims of what Jesus has to do. And that's helpful in understanding Jewish people around you and the whole picture of the Bible and not just the personal redemption part of the New Testament. Thanks for listening to this episode. As we mentioned at the top of the episode, you can enter for a chance to win our Lost Tribes coffee. For free, you, we give away one bag a month. So if you go to our website, a Jew and a Gentile discuss.org, or you can click in the show notes if you're listening to this on a podcast app, you can enter to win there. If you want to hear more episodes of this podcast, subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. We'd also love if you'd leave us a review or a comment. You can follow us on social media at the handle a Jew and a Gentile discuss. Um, We'd love to engage with you, ask any questions you have, and sometimes we answer those on, on the future podcasts. Thanks again for listening this week, and we'll see you next week. This show is a production of Jewish Voice Ministries International.